Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to those that have already joined and to others that are rapidly joining us fast as I see the numbers increase. Um, welcome to today's seminar hosted um, under the Women Working for Change. And our topic for today is creative industries. How can Africa capitalize on its artistic boom. Um, I think we have some fantastic speakers. We've got a great expert that will give us the kind of broader um, economic and other interesting insights from um, their work. Um, and I hope that we'll be able to have a robust conversation, challenge each other and find a pathway to um, this very exciting, um, I think, path um, for the continent and also for the creative industries. Now, um, I think before um, we get into the session, I just wanted to give some context in terms of um, who I am and um, also just uh, some information um, around women working for change. Um, my name is Crystal Audison. I'm based in um, Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm a journalist at the moment. I um, work for a television station based here in South Africa, and I'll be moderating the session today. Now, just some background in terms of who has brought us all together here to discuss this very interesting topic. Um, you, um, so this seminar and webinar is under the banner of Women Working for Change, also known as WFC, which is a unit of the Africa CEO Forum, which I'm sure most of you know about, um, dedicated to African economies and especially female game changers and of course, business leaders. And it's there to really connect us, promote women leaders, share insights, share ideas. Um, and we also see that you know, this webinar on creative industries really is around the continuation of the women um, working for change um, and its ambitions to really engage in um, thoughtful and thought provoking discussions under different themes. And of course, what matters to African female game changers. Um, so what we'll also see in the coming weeks and months, uh, the women working for change will announce quarterly webinars um, around some very interesting topics some strategies and I think also just a forum for for us to connect to engage and to hear from um, game changers in the field as to what's been happening um, sharing ideas um, and so the next webinar will actually happen in December um, and the theme will be women in STEM um, and so I think right now the good news that I can announce is that women working for change will be part of the 2022 Africa CEO Forum, which will happen in March 2022 in person um, in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, and which I'm sure all of us um, will be excited um, to know that it will be an in-person event. Um, and hopefully we'll see each other there. So just some house rules that we're going through. Of course, we can ask questions during the Q&A. Very importantly, a poll will be launched during the conference. Please feel free to vote. And of course, if you have any issues, there'll be a Q&A that we can ask some follow-up questions. And of course, don't forget to please tweet hashtag ACF digital events throughout. If there's any questions or interesting tidbits or pictures, please, please do tweet so that we can trend on Twitter. And so right now it gives me a great pleasure to um, just give you a brief intro on some of our amazing experts and of course panelists that's partaking um, in today's session. Um, our expert today is Aubrey Ruby. She's a senior fellow at the African Center for the Atlantic Council. Um, she's also an active investor in African startups. Um, and I think what's interesting, Aubrey, I did some research on you, of course. Google is a wonderful, um, you know, a research tool. And it's interesting, you wrote an article in Newsweek in 2016, and the title was How Nigeria Can Ride Out Its Economic Storm. Um, and, I, and I thought it's interesting, it was written a few years ago, but one could easily say that it's, you know, it, it could be the same question one can ask 
um, you know, what's happening in Nigeria now. So it's a great pleasure for us to welcome you, Aubrey. Then we also have um, Lauren Kwasi Olsen. Um, she's the founder and CEO of Creative Industries, which is um, a vehicle to communicate African values, culture, and history. And I am looking forward to hearing from Lauren around investment, around the industry, and of course, how COVID has impacted um, all of us, um, and especially um, the creative industries and what you've been able to, to learn and that you'll be able to share with us, um, you know, in terms of your journey. Our next speaker is Awa Adi Awa Fisio. Um, she's head of music for Sub-Saharan Africa on YouTube. Um, which I'm sure, Adi, it's a big, big job. I mean, we know that during COVID, our best friend became Google and, of course, listening to music on YouTube, seeing music videos. Um, and so we're really looking forward to your insights and just sharing some of, you know, your, the experiences that you've had the past year um, during COVID and how the continent came, um, you know, to the, to the party with its um, different music um, themes and of course yeah I can just think of in South Africa we all went a bit crazy with um, one song that uh, kept us all going so I'm looking forward to hearing your views on Jerusalem and then I also have my fellow um, South African which is Yolanda Nokutkwana um, she's the acting head of industry and development at the National Film and Video Foundation, also here based in Johannesburg. Um, Yolanda has worked in the industry extensively and she'll be able to share us some insights, not only on the South African film industry um, and how I think COVID had given the industry some, some really good opportunities, but also share some of her insights um, around the rest of the continent, what's happening in East Africa, and of course, um, one can't have a conversation around form if we don't, um, you know, include Nollywood in all of this. And then last but not least, we're fortunate and um, very lucky to have um, Rokia um, Traore, and she is a music and songwriter. She's based in Ma in Bamako, and she's going to share some very insights into the work that she's done. But I think more importantly for me, that apart from that she's actively involved as a singer, she's also put her money into establishing a foundation to train young people, to provide some support. And so we've got some questions that we'll engage Rokia on that we look forward um, to, um, to hearing from her. And so on that note, I will be taking a short um, break and listen to the very insightful Aubrey Ruby, who will give us a presentation um, and some you know, insights into the work that she do. Thank you, Ruby. Aubrey. Thank you, Crystal. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you today and some friends, and I look forward to hearing the panel after speaking. Um, really, I wanted to start with uh, the kind of macro level trends that are driving the growth of the creative industries. Um, I you know, 20 years doing investment advisory across African markets. And, you know, until mid, I would say 2000s, there was not that much focus on big industries outside of the extractives. And then I came, I wrote a book that came out in 2015. But I started researching it in 2013. And we thought we were, my co-author and I were quite ambitious when we wrote a lot of the book about the potential of the creative industries. And part of that was built just on demographic realities. So we know that by 2035, Sub-Saharan Africa will have more working age population than the rest of the world combined. That there are 1 million Africans that turn 18 every month. And it's the youngest continent in the world. And because of the, that youthful dynamism, you have such an interest in the kind of media entertainment space and the proliferation of smartphones uh, has allowed for a window of the world to be what's held in our hand every single day. And <clears throat> you're having smartphone penetration increase dramatically. Uh, you know, already there are about 750 million people who have a cell phone. I see numbers between 680 to 700 million smartphones, and the price of smartphones continue to decrease. Um, and the price of data continues to decrease and, and availability of data increase. So Google and Facebook uh, are investing uh, a ton of money into uh, connectivity in the region. 
So you have the undersea cables that are running to the region, funded by Google, funded by Facebook, that are expanding broadband capacity. And you essentially have an interest by both the tech giants to uh, reach these young people. And because of the growth of the uh, connectivity, you have platforms for the creative industries. And one of the things that's most interesting or exciting about the creative industries in terms of driving economic development in African markets is the fact that a film or, or a song is a non-rival good. So that's a very you know, dorky uh, economist way of saying it can be consumed both domestically and internationally. So if you watch a movie, if you watch a Nollywood film and you're streaming it in Lagos, someone could be streaming it at exactly the same time in Atlanta. And it's both, in, so it's an export in that sense, but it doesn't take away from being able to consume it locally. So it's not like uh, a pineapple or a, a ton of platinum, which is either it has to be stayed domestic or international. So this is actually a non-rival good, which has incredible potential to drive growth. And we're seeing that growth. So if you look to the next slide, you're seeing growth. And I just pulled from both the Kenya and the Nigerian market. And these are revenue from entertainment and media. And so you see, even in Kenya, uh, an increase from 2014, which was an exciting year for me, because as I said, I was writing my book then looking at the creative industries. And <clears throat> there was about a billion dollars in revenue. And that's soon in a year or so to hit 3 billion in Kenya. So these are not small amounts when you think about them relative to GDP and employment. In Nigeria, Nigeria has always been a larger entertainment market because of Nollywood and the music industry. And you see that growth happening from essentially a 2 billion mark to over 8 billion today. Um, and it became such an important uh, uh, piece of the economy that the Nigerian government, when rebasing their GDP, actually looked to see how much for the first time Nollywood was contributing to GDP. And you have something between three and 5% of GDP, which is not um, insignificant. So it's a growing portion of economic activity. And there's many jobs that come from it because it's not just the direct artists and the um, you know, actors, it's the industries around. So production, it's distribution, um, it's the hairstylists, it's the video shooting, it's all of the extra things, it's concert promoters, um, that go on the uh, kind of periphery of the industry. And that's what makes it a full industry. So for your next slide, please. Um, and you see it not only happening streaming, which is what we always think about, but also in person. And in person is very important in African markets. And so what you see in this particular, these two uh, graphs here, um, is you see an increase in actual music event revenue and we know that musicians are um, <clears throat> doing in-person uh, in and they make a lot of their, the percentage of their income for in-person in events. And South Africa leads the way for in-person events. Now this is right before the end of uh, the beginning of 2020. So obviously COVID uh, hurt the in-person. But if you look at year on year on year through 2019, both cinema, cinema revenues were increasing and uh, in-person music uh, revenues were increasing. Next slide, please. And speaking to the uh, export potential of the market, it's incredible the number of collaborations. There's been an explosion on the global <clears throat> music scene of collaborations between uh, Nigerian artists, Burna Boy, WizKid, uh, Tiwa, others, and, <clears throat> and obviously well-established acts from Nicki Minaj on down. Uh, South Africa singer Elaine just recently signed with Columbia Records. Um, we're going to see more Grammys won. You just see greater, particularly transatlantic collaboration happening between African and a lot of African American, um, but just African American artists uh, in the US. You have, because of this, it's really become a vector of African soft power in addition to economic growth. It's a lot about rebranding and the continent being seen differently. Um, in the book, The Next Africa that I wrote in 2014, 15, we imagined, imagine a world where Nigerian Afrobeats would be played in you know, coffee shops in Manhattan, and that's already come and gone. And, and it was 
It was really a, a world that we thought was uh, coming and it came even faster than we had thought. Uh, so it's about collaboration. It's about changing the brand of the country and the continent and growing into the potential of uh, benefiting from these rich cultural productions. And so that's the other question. Are, are uh, African businesses a part of this? Uh, and so what we're seeing is if you look at the next slide, there's a lot of investment happening and the investment is coming from the outside. It's also coming from the inside. Um, so you have all the big players, all the big music uh, record labels have opened, um, opened offices on the continent. You have the platform Boomplay, which is invested and owned by the Chinese, but it has interactions with all the major uh, music groups. In addition to Spotify uh, having even more uh, African artists on its platform. Uh, we're gonna hear about YouTube as well. You're starting to see funds that are emerging from the continent. Have a fund has been well established in the space, um, but Roberta Anon and her AFEC fund um, is also growing. And they launched last week in partnership with AFDB, a hundred million euro fund focused on uh, investing in the creative and fashion enterprises. So you're seeing more funds. There's probably not enough yet. And I look forward to hearing from Lorene and others on this panel on where the gaps are. Um, but it's, it's in music and it's in film and it's in fashion. The attention is growing. I think what many people are looking for, and that's why we're gonna transition into this panel now, is tangible opportunities to invest and be part of this growth. So with that, I'll turn over to Crystal and we'll hear from our experts. Thank you so much, Aubrey. What an in, insightful um, presentation. I mean, as you say, one knew that Bernaboy and Jerusalem was going to be big, but I don't think we could imagine how actually how big they've become. So thank you um, for that presentation. And so I will, um, op, I mean, I have introduced our, our speakers, but I think, uh, you know, Lauren, because you're so actively involved in business, um, just from your um, perspective and insight, you know, Aubrey's presentation really outlined the immense opportunities and also the challenges. But just from your point of view, I mean, what what do you think? Um, you know, the, the, the kind of tangible opportunities um, that you see um, from that presentation that shared, and of course, from your um, experience and expertise. Thank you, Krista. I think, first of all, when we talk about creative industries, I mean, they're very, very large, right? We cannot. Uh, standardize the investment strategy in all these industries. You don't invest in an entertainment company the same way as in a fashion company, the same way in the food business. So I think it's also a question of really uh, within the creative industries, identifying the, the, the different pools and windows of opportunities. Of course, when we look at the entertainment business, it's account for most of the creative industry, thanks to Nollywood and thanks to, to big players, as far as Burian is concerned, we have, we have decided to dedicate ourselves to the fashion accessories and consumer goods, so um, actually a brands. And I think there is a strong opportunity there. Money is actually flowing on the continent because creative industries and like the fashion industry are very sexy. But the issue is, uh, our players are very fragile. So every action shouldn't be focusing on the money flowing in, but actually on the kind of support that we're bringing to those entrepreneurs, because it's actually a question of transforming artists, designers into entrepreneurs. And this is not something that comes as, a, as an easy ride in terms of journey. So I think that it's important that the debate really focuses on capacity building and how can we really make sure that those, I mean, that creative boom actually transform into an economic opportunity? And there, I think it's a question of investing, structuring, giving access to an ecosystem and facilitates expansion and distribution routes. So I would love to really maybe focusing more on the um, fashion industry and the concrete action and steps we have implemented at the Rimian to um, creative entrepreneurship based also on the feedback of the other panelists um, on, that, on, on that conference today. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you so much, Lauren. I think your last point was so interesting around the debate around capacity building, investing in the creative boom. And I think this is then ideal for Addy to respond because I, I'm sure you have lots of stories to share with us, but just in terms of how as head of Sub-Saharan African YouTube, I'm sure you have lots to share with us around this issue and others. Addy? Yeah, thank you. And uh, thanks again for, for having me. And I, I, I think I agree with Lauren um, about not just capacity building, but also economic boom. And I think what we've seen, um, not just on YouTube, but just with the creative economy in general is how much monetization that comes out of it. So a lot of the creators, um, in my previous role, I used to work with creators and media broadcasters. And a lot of the creators didn't even know that they could monetize their content, right? They started either creating content from a hobby. Um, so Mark Angel, for instance, who's uh, one of our biggest creators on YouTube with over 7 million subscribers on his channel. He started creating videos on his phone. And he used to say that in order to share it with people, he will put it on a flash drive and give it to different people so that they can watch. And people will then copy it and give it to other people. And that's how his content started kind of making the rounds in his small city um, um, in Potakot uh, in Nigeria. And then from there, someone who actually watched his his comedy skit said, you know, you can make money out of, out of these videos that you're doing. And he said, oh, how? I have to sell it to TV. And he said, no, you could just put it up on YouTube and you can monetize the content. And that's how he, he started. And now he's one of the biggest, or he's actually the biggest um, creator uh, in Africa with, you know, 7 million subscribers. So I think it's, it's getting creators to that point where they know that they can monetize their content, whether that's through advertising that they're getting or through brand deals. I watch a lot of content now, whether it's on TikTok or Instagram, and you're watching it and you're laughing and next thing you see a brand pop up or you realize, oh, this is actually a branded content. The creator is creating a particular content about a beverage or about food. And so I think creators are also evolving to realize that they, their creativity can earn them money, but not just in the traditional way of being an actress and getting paid to be in a movie. It's through brands. Brands want to reach an audience. And as long as you have that audience on the platform that you use, whether that's YouTube or Facebook or any other platform, brands will come to you to be able to reach that audience and you get to monetize that. Um, and I think it's helping, helping to, to helping to kind of hone that in for the creative industry is how do you make sure that you're monetizing the talent and the content that you have because there's wow. a lot of work that goes into it <laughs> absolutely it's not just you know getting a million views Eddie. how insightful um and so on that in terms of monetizing um yolanda you work for the national form and video foundation and i know um how you have supported throughout the years emerging filmmakers in south africa but given what we've heard from Lauren and from Adi, what is your view around one, the, the monetization of, you know, different, whether it's music or movies, um, you know, what is your insights and the, some of the lessons from the National Film and Video Foundation? Because we do know that there's not an unlimited, unlimited supply of money um, and that you do have your own challenges um, in terms of um, building an industry. Uh, thank you for that, Crystal. I think um, Eddie just, uh, touched on a very important issue, which is around uh, monetization of the content. Because we, I mean, the National Film and Video Foundation focuses primarily on film and primarily on filmmakers that work independently. Um, and the biggest challenge has been is not even the quality. I think the biggest challenge, especially in, 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 in the continent, is that film in, and, and I suppose art at large is not necessarily seen as an economic driver. Even with all the potential that it does have, it's seen as something that is a hobby. And, um, and some of the challenges that we have had, and I, and I think it's challenges that are across the continent is about, you know, sort of like formalizing or professionalizing the, the, the art space and 
uh, being able to motivate and show that you do um, you are generating or you are actually contributing to the to the economy. I mean, if you think from a job creation point of view, I think um, the film industry in particular literally hires from you know highly skilled uh, to non skilled from um, all types of industries. There's like a lot of industries that are involved in the film industry, whether it be from logistic or from the artists themselves. And it, um, what the challenge has been is about how do we then amortize that content? I mean, a, a lot of the content that comes from South Africa is um, there's a lot of high end films um, that just most of them make it to festivals. And what we've not been able to do is we've, we've gotten the content right, we've gotten the quality we've got in the art right but what we have not been able to do is is uh being able to monetize that and there is a limit uh, in the continent there's very limited distributions um platforms especially in the in the, in the traditional sense um however i think in this past year you know with everything that came with COVID, we also saw quite a change in terms of how people are consuming content because now people were able to sit at home and be able to explore um the vod platforms you know the youtubes and all these other spaces that um, at first we would have thought that we don't have the time i think the only challenge that then comes with those is you know the bandwidth or the fiber that um in africa is still not really in place, but in spaces where the fiber is there and people are able to afford um, data, then the consumption of that content has been quite evident, especially throughout the COVID. And I think it's about how do, you know, as we evolve and with this new normal, how do we then get to a space where we're amortizing the content? We now know how to make the content. Um, even through spaces as you know, like YouTube for short term uh, for short content, it's about actually also rebranding what what art is and 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 being able to establish ourselves as as businesses as opposed to artists. I think the the idea of even producers being able to get into the room as business people and sit in the table and talk you know, structured deals in terms of if I, if you invest, this is what you get, um, this is what you get in return. And I think what we have missed is the language of being able to sort of speak to, uh, you know, corporate businesses or speak to private and equity investors is how do you then package yourself in such a way that you're not just talking about art, but you're actually making them be able to see the growth um, and the potential. And just talking from the National Film and Video Foundation point of view, I think what we have tried to do within the, you know, or within the times of COVID is also find corporate partners or find um, private partners to partner with, to be able to say, come on board. I mean, we did like a small partnership with TikTok, which is traditionally what we wouldn't do on ordinarily because we're more on long form content. But we realized that there is a bit, there was like, a, you know, people, the content is there, but it was like, how do you then take your content and then get money for it? How do you do the same thing and get paid for it? And it's just about being able to sort of like um, change the way people think, even the creators themselves. I think mostly the creators themselves change the way we view ourselves and therefore change the perception of how we are viewed and uh, be able to, um, to present the industries as, as economic drivers and not just you know, hobbies as, as um, it has been established in the past. Thank you so much, Yolanda, because I think you've summarized what we, I was hoping to get out of, of you know, this, this kind of the first few opening remarks from all the speakers was to talk about the risk, risks, because we know um, some of the risks and, you know, one could perceive COVID as one of the biggest risks, but it's also an opportunity. Um, but I think also all of you touched on how can we break down barriers, you know, and it's there is the funding opportunities, but the barrier could be how to access that funding. And now we know, as Yolanda mentioned, um, or as Addy mentioned, monetize your TikTok video, um, you know, and how do you do it? I mean, I think, Addy, your story about the USB was so interesting of how, can you imagine a USB being transferred from person to person? But clearly, you know, um, um, and, I, and I think that leads us to also around 
how to organize um, the industry. And so thanks for, for those um, points um, from, from Lauren, Adi and Yolanda. Um, and so for now, we just, we're taking a, a slightly different approach to the, um, the next session. Um, we are very fortunate to have an amazing artist um, that's in Bamako, um, Rokia Traore. Um, and she is not only an artist, but I think what's been absolutely amazing that, you know, she works with young people, she works with artists, but she's also invested some of her own money um, to ensure that the creative industry gets the push that they so much need um, in um, her home country. So thank you so much, Rukia, for joining us. Um, and I'll start with asking you the question, as a Malian artist, um, how do you feel about the artistic boom that we're seeing in Africa at the moment? Well, thank you for having me as part of this uh, panel. I, I think as an artist, uh, and after tw 25, 26 years of career, when I started, I didn't know uh, that I will uh, do uh, all the things I did and that I will have the career I had. Uh, but it happened, and uh, uh, basically, and mainly, it happened in uh, Europe and US and everywhere else, of course, also in Africa. But uh, uh, it, there were not so many possibilities to perform in Africa because at, when I started my career 25 years ago, we used to tour uh, uh, all the, the, the streaming possibilities didn't exist. And um, even now uh, it's something else. This, that is very different from a live show and uh, anyhow, uh, the streaming, the, 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 the amazing uh, uh, craze uh, of streaming is, uh, uh, the, yes, it's a beautiful thing for Africa and uh, uh, um, the, the, the culture industry for uh, the continent. But um, still, uh, to make this artistic boom something positive for the continent and an opportunity for us to uh, uh, start an organization of a real cu culture industry uh, from which we could uh, um, uh, have people uh, uh, well trained in uh, all the skills connected or related to uh, music directly or any other artistic skills. We need uh, to start an organization for in the continent itself to have spaces where to um, uh, give this possibility to professionals to become professionals because I, yeah, I think- Sorry, it's apologies. Can you switch on your camera? Because everybody would like to see you. Ah, you it was- give us it, some insights. I'm sorry, I thought it was on. So, I mean, in, in a specific profession, the first thing to yearn for is an environment uh, where you can practice, uh, develop and enhance your abilities. An optimal environment for any skill uh, uh, also includes the possibility for uh, skill workers to sell what they produce. And of course, uh, again, the, the, the streaming craze is for sure uh, advantageous for African art and culture. However, still, we need physical spaces inside the continent um, for the artists to create and uh, not in luxuries, but productive conditions. And then, uh, of course, it's, it's great to, to monetize everything you can have uh, uh, on streaming in different ways, but you have to have the possibility to do it the best way to pretend to a professional level. Uh, and uh, I think what we have for now is uh, um, uh, the, 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 the fact it became easy to show the panel of amazing potential, uh, artistic potential inside the continent 
for English speaking countries, French speaking countries from the south to the, to the north of Africa, uh, the continent is full of amazing uh, artists and uh, so many opportunities and pot uh, potentials we even don't know yet. But how to go from there to um, a, a culture industry? Um, real that we can feel and see and uh, from which we can have a dynamic in the countries on the continent i think that for me for now the, the artistic boom is it, it's a very good thing but uh, we still have um uh, the same problem, even though the uh, uh, real um, thing, changes are happening uh, in Nigeria as the, or Kenya or South Africa, I mean, in English speaking countries, uh, things are really changing in a, a positive way, but we have to be careful because um, that doesn't mean that inside our countries, we started um, understanding how to make uh, uh, culture um, a professional uh, environment, well-structured with uh, uh, all the, not just the, because when you take music, as she said, um, it was uh, Lauren who said the, the, that the creative uh, uh, industries are really, it's really large, but if, when we take simply art itself, we, there's several things inside that. There's music, there's cinema, there's a fashion, there's a design in different ways. So um, there are so many things uh, to, uh, to, to develop and each of these skills uh, are related to other uh, professions. Low in music, uh, where I, I I feel the most comfortable uh, uh, to to talk about uh, how things go and uh, how I think they can, could be um, uh, uh, made in a different way or more positive way or productive way for Africa. Um, I can say that we have, for example, lawyers um, in terms of. Um, uh, um, uh, publishing management. We have uh, all the agents. We have the uh, technical uh, uh, skills, sound and light. We have people uh, who have to take care of staging. So all these uh, professions are related to music and also cinema. But uh, what do we have in Africa today to train these people? And once they are trained, to give them opportunities to work and uh, make money, of course, through streaming. But we, you know, I think that it's not enough. It's uh, there's a boom through that possibility of streaming, but it is not uh, yet um, the 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 proof of a real professional professionalization of uh, uh, um, uh, culture. Uh, the industry area in Africa in general. We still need to work about that. Great, thank you so much, Rukia. I mean, you really touched on a, a whole set of issues in terms of challenges, but also, of course, opportunities. I mean, one question that I would like to ask you, and perhaps Lauren could also um, add, you, Rukia, invested 1 million euros of your own money um, in setting up um, your foundation um, and working with musicians um, in your home country. Now, I want to know from you, um, have you had private investors coming to the table to say, you've given one million, so are we giving you? Um, and if so, um, you know, has that expanded what you're doing? Um, are you hoping to even expand to other countries? Um, and Lauren, you know, how do you decide where do you decide to invest your money um, in a sort of unicorn, um, as they call it in the um, investor world? Lauren or me? <laughs> uh, Rokia, you can go first and then we'll have Lauren responding. I think much, much more than a million euro, you know, uh, that I invested here. Because for me first, it was about how to feel comfortable and create from my country. 
providing uh, uh, opportunities to other people around me, young artists, technicians, and all the people, as I said, who are the profession related to music or theater production uh, on stage, of course, but also for streaming and also to sell our productions abroad. That's what I've been doing since 10 years, uh, creating shows and uh, um, collaborating with uh, huge artists uh, in opera, uh, music and uh, in theater or literature and uh, creating everything here because in our small theater, we can do that. Before that, I used to uh, be obliged to travel to Europe and bring everyone there, making huge expenses and sometimes uh, the, the cost of the travels and food and uh, um, uh, accommodation and everything uh, was a real uh, um, uh, problem for some productions we had to give up. And now it's easier in addition to the pleasure of working from home and showing to people here who have no idea of what I do when I'm traveling, when I what I go uh, with in Europe, and when I show uh, uh, to show them what we do when we are touring all around the world, and they can come and see the, the rehearsals, and also uh, it's a possibility for young artists because when we produce here, I can employ more young African artists. I, in general, we we um, send messages through Facebook and uh, uh, our website. And some young artists come from uh, uh, Burkina Faso. We used to have some drummers who came from Nigeria, Ghana, uh, Ivory Coast, uh, because we need to 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 choose a, dr a drummer for a specific project. So that's the way we do since ten years. And uh, this is it was easy for me because I I found this way to connect the foundation to my professional career so we didn't I didn't have any problem of money because we used to sell what we produce that's what I'm talking about founding is a good thing um, having support is necessary but it mustn't be a solution it's to develop something and I can say that it is possible over the last 10 years that's what I've been doing mainly the manner we put in the foundation to build all the spaces and uh, to try to organize also uh, um, uh, uh, things in a way when I'll stop touring, we'll have resources at least to pay everyone working here. We have 30 people working to clean, to cook because we have a restaurant. We're building uh, uh, rooms so to um, uh, be able also to do some, uh, uh, how do you call that? Some, some the French is much easier for me than <laughs> English. Okay. Uh, you know, to do hotel rooms and restaurant and swimming pools for people. All that is to find ways to make money. Where we need money is, for sure, for now, to support young artists. How to, because there are some productions, if it's not my own productions that I know I can sell because I have 25 years career, I'm known and I can easily sell uh, projects where I am myself. Um, but when it's about a young artist, we don't have this source of uh, income. We have to uh, have some money to put in their project or also sometimes they need training. And we also need, to um, uh, get people coming and uh, uh, attending at what these young artists do. And in okay. Africa, in Mali, that's a, a real problem because there's a disconnection. Thank you so much for that insight, Rukia, because I think you're on the ground and you, you've experienced it as an artist, but also working with people. So, but before um, I go on to you, Lauren, um, we have of course launched, uh, launched a survey um, and so I do hope that we, we have a, a poll question and that you will um, be able to partake in that survey and we'll be able to give you the results at the end of it. Um, it will be um, hosts and the panelists can vote um, on this. So on that, Rukia, you've, um, sorry, Lauren, you've heard what's happening on the ground. You've heard from other panelists also, of course, now from Rukia, 
Now, as a, you know, you're a CEO, you, you look at business opportunities. How do you decide um, who to fund and how do you also access all these funds that we've been hearing about? Yes, thank you. Sorry. Um, I mean, we are, we have a very humble approach, you know, like as far as Bereman is concerned, we have not announced you know, tons of tons of billions to be launched because I mean it's it takes time to to invest in a brand. So we all, we also had the same kind of approach as Rukia in the sense that Bereman was created as part of my, with my personal investment. And also we reach out, we raise funds with uh, individual investors. And this is very important because actually I think we've reached a status where in terms of industry, where we can prove an investment thesis. And the investment thesis of Birman is the one of the African way to the business of fashion. So, so what we tend to say is that when you, when you look at the fashion industry with the financial angle, like with the one of a private investor, makes sense to actually uh, proceed by category. So the way we approach it, for example, like when you look at African brands, you have different kinds of stage of maturity, high-end brands, which are much more capital growth, smaller acceleration, really, really smooth incubation, and then seed. The way we tend to position ourselves is from acceleration to capital growth. So how do we choose brands to invest in? We have a creative board made of the most prominent figures of the fashion and creative scene in France and in Europe and also on the continent. Um, and they are the ones who are actually guiding us on the creative angle. Because as I said, in that particular industry as fashion, for instance, you need to have both pillars, the investment, which is really important, but being able to spot creative talents and the capacity of that talent to expand in a given geography is what will make the difference. So when we look at a typical brand, we just don't look at it like, okay, that brand needs money, we'll invest. No, we look at the different kind of pillars that need to be strengthened. Sometimes brand platform, of most of the time brand platform, uh, e-commerce capacities, how do brand structure collection, um, what's the distribution strategy, something that we discuss a lot now with our brand is whether we have to go B2B or B2C, guess what, the, risk, the, the answer might be both depending on the brand and the status of maturity. So we don't have a one size fits all investment strategy, we really adapt it to the need of the brand, its particular positioning and its expansion. Because also, when we look at our brands, and by our, I say African heritage brand, you also tend to see different kind of dynamics. Some very strong creative brands with an upside potential that can also only be at the international level to go back to the continent. Why? Because the, creative, the creativity today is unfortunately not as well perceived by our local people, by our continent, than internationally. So when you see a brand that is really creative and that is successful at the international level, most of the time, it doesn't have that own and strong recognition on the continent. So it's also for us to help the brand identify the right market to expand and also the right strategy to come back to the continent with the right audience. Something we talked a lot about now also is merchandising, how structural collection. But again, the question is so vast. And I mean, I have to, 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 to stick to what we do, the fashion industry. I would like to, to conclude with that point, which is food for tof, because I think it's a very important one. What we call merchtainment. It's a new trend that we've seen this year and that has been developed, I mean, I mean, launched by Balenciaga uh, during the Paris Fashion Week lately, so two weeks ago. And it's a combination of fashion and entertainment. When we look at the creative industry on the continent, fashion and, and, and entertainment, if we leave the film music industry aside, account for 90% of our creative industries. So this is where there is a significant opportunity for the continent to leapfrog again on some kind of trends into the creative industry. So I think the question is really now, how do we get all those different kind of segments together to make sense and for them to grow even more? I think that's the right kind of question and debate that we should ask. And as far as we're concerned, it's a, it's a trend we'd like to really follow 
and make sure that we plug our brands to the entertainment industry, so the music industry, so that we can increase and resonate uh, their audience position, attraction and attractivity throughout the world. Thank you. Excellent. Which I think, which brings me to Adi, um, you know, what would be your response to Lauren's um, very, you know, this important point, of course, you know, how do we get the different segments to actually talk to each other? You, you're muted, Adi, just unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I feel like that's the favorite word during um, video conferences. And I know you're on mute, you're on mute. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think what I've been seeing a lot more is conversations like this, right? And more summits. So I think I've gotten invited to a lot more summits where like different parties are coming together to just share ideas and minds. Um, and I think seeing it's one of the interesting things or one of the pluses that has come out of COVID is we realize that we don't always have to be in the same place and you don't always have to meet in person. So I think a lot of the virtual conversations um, that have happened, we've actually seen a lot of uh, uh, partnerships or, or uh, um, uh, a lot of collaborations that have come out of getting on a, a Zoom call or a Google Meet call um, to discuss with people. I think Lauren mentioned something about merch and merchandising. Um, and I think it's one of the things that we also see at YouTube beyond you know, creators using advertising, right? We're seeing more what we call alternative monetization, right? So whether it's branding your own t-shirt and getting your fans to actually buy that merch or um, through membership. So what that means is, you know, creators give particular content to, to their super fans. Um, and I think we're gonna start seeing more and more of like alternative monetization uh, measures. And we're gonna start having more and more conversations um, where whether it's creators or even um, government buddies um, are coming together and just kind of talking about how we can, what are some of the rules or policies that we can put in place? Because I think things from copyright, uh, things from um, also just even going back to monetization, government sort of does play a role in kind of creating uh, uh, an industry that enables um, kind of that creativity and, and also, you know, cracks down on copyright matters. Thank you, Ade. So Yolanda, which brings me to your now uh, question around at this point of alternative monetization. And of course, one cannot have a discussion around creative industries if we don't talk about Nollywood. I mean, we're talking 7.2 billion GDP in 2016. I mean, those numbers, of course, have doubled. Um, and so Yolanda, just from your perspective, you know, what has Nollywood meant for Africa um, and what have been some of the lessons learned for the South African industry um, that they could they learned from um, Nollywood and how can we expand it to the rest of the continent in East Africa, other parts of West Africa, and of course in Southern Africa and Central as well. Um, thank you for that. I think the one thing that we've learned from Nollywood is is the fact that uh, projects and content created um, or homegrown content that's created in the continent or, or if within that country can actually be profitable and make money. Um, just even from the invention of how, you know, like Nollywood started, you know, with making cheap content that they were selling directly co to consumers. It was very much about the people on the ground and now they're starting to enjoy, you know, the audiences outside of their country. So I think what 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 Nollywood has taught us, at, at at least even in the in the southern region, is that I think we've always made content um, that was high in, in quality, and it never really resonated in you know in the country. So it would do well outside the country, but not necessarily in the country. And what Nollywood has really taught us is the fact that um, film, in particular, is uh, can be commercial is commercial as that it is actually a business that can be done. Um, it's a business um, that 
can that the private sector can invest in. I think that's what Hollywood, I mean, Nollywood has taught us. Um, and that audiences, our first audiences are here in, in, in the country. And the fact that there's, there's power in resonance, there's power in, in, in creating um, a product that, you, uh, you know, the, your, 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 your people in the country can be able to consume then before you travel as opposed to doing it the other way around. And I think they have literally, particularly in South Africa, been able to, I mean, we, we ha we've been doing this for a while in terms of um, generating films and, and having a very concretized industry from, you know, um, from service industry, you know, from um, core productions, but what Nollywood has done is to say, if you invest in your own, you know, if you've got skin in the game, if you invest in your own project, if you bring in private sector in, but also the fact that, because I think the biggest, uh, it, um, or the biggest fall in, in our content is the distribution. And the fact that Nollywood has said, if you speak directly to your people, if you go to where they are, then once you, you, you create a culture, basically, I think what Nollywood has done is create a film culture, create um, a, a, a consumer market that wants to um, watch and that has an appetite for, uh, for African content. And when we looking at Nollywood, it's like, how do we then get to a point where we're making content that first South Africans or the will buy and then Africans will buy into um, and that we are actually our first audience and that there's more there's actually a whole lot of potential I mean the average age in in, in Africa we are there's someone was saying we are the youngest um, a growing economy from an age point of view as well is that the average age is a 19, 19 years old is the average age um, in in the continent, meaning that there's more actually potential in the future. In South Africa, the film industry um, is made out of the working class of the film industry is about sixty five percent, which is a big percentage of um, the youth. So. I think yes, yeah, the, you know, there's different ways of of um, of approaching film. There's the OTA way. There's the servicing, and then there's the Nollywood. And I think the Nollywood thus far has shown to be the most sustainable one in both in the long term and in the short term. Great, thank you so much, Yolanda. Um, I think because we had that survey launched, I just want to check: do we have that survey results out yet? Okay, maybe not. Um, so this is a question that I have to all our, our speakers. You've, you've set us the scene, you've given us the challenges, you've given us the opportunities, um, but it's sort of in closing, how would you say, can, how can we ensure that the creative industries, you know, really have an impact on development and of course, deal with our employment crisis we have on the continent? Um, how can we really harness it? Um, and what do you think um, the, the, you know, the creative industries can bring to the table? And I'll start with you, Lauren. Thank you, Crystal. I think creative industries actually, they're, they're a strong soft power because in the way they enable us to change our narrative, to change our image and to, ch to change even the way we sell ourselves. So I think that what is really critical for now is that as us African, we really need to find a way to promote, sustain, develop, maintain our creative industries. And we need to have strategies that are um, consistent with the need, specific needs, stage of maturity of the key players and actors in each sub-segment of creative industries. I think that what, what we tend to do with generalization might be a mistake that will lead us to fail if we're not structured enough. I think now has come the time also to come with the specific expertise to really support properly those industries. So to conclude, I would say we have once in a lifetime opportunity to make this right, to change our image through creative industries and really to identify the right scheme model in terms of investment, entrepreneurship, and growth in each sub-segment of the creative industries. As far as Beriman is concerned, we have chosen the fashion and consumer goods and cosmetic industry, 
We think we have the right approach. Time will tell, and we hope to be successful in the long run. Thanks. Adi? Thanks. Um, I think, and I wanted to touch some, on something Yolanda said about Nollywood real quick, and then I'll, I'll come to the closing. But I think what has been so uh, powerful also about Nollywood is the exportability, right? The fact that people in the US, the UK, in France um, are watching Nollywood or, or even like in the Caribbean or even in China, right? And I think it's the exportability of that content. And, and what seen in not only even with Nollywood, but even with content from South Africa, I mean, Blood and Water is such a huge success story for South Africa, for Netflix, right? It's when it was the season one was launched, it was, um, I think number one globally in about 10 markets, right? So I think thinking about how can our content also export outside of our markets is one of the things in terms of enabling our creative industry, right? Because we, we still have challenges in Africa, whether it's from data or from disposable income, there are things that are just structure, structurally challenging that I think need to be resolved for us to see the creative industry thrive in the way that it should thrive, right? But outside of those challenges, how can we tap into the audience internationally, right? Because audience internationally consuming content, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on Netflix, helps contribute money back into the pockets of the creators on the continent, right? So I think one of the major ways that we can strengthen our creative industries, not just thinking about consumption on the continent, but thinking about consumption and monetization internationally and thinking about how can we get some of those dollars from the other countries um, into the pockets of creators um, on the continent. Thanks, Adi. Yolanda? Um, thank you. I think that um we we had there is an opportunity with just also you know like where maybe we we may have been lacking is um you know with the new distribution platforms that are starting to invest um in the continent uh you know like the likes of disney coming to africa the likes of the amazon and the netflix um, is that there's an opportunity for us to be able to take our content to the world. But I think we have to be at a point again where um, we, you know, are, we are ready to have content that can be consumed by the world. And I think also that it's also the, the idea of creating uh, content that is global is that the, the, there is value in creating content that is as specific as possible to where it's made, obviously with an intention that it should go globally. But I think in terms of the distribution platforms, I think that is starting to open up. And also the, the with that opening up, that means there's more competition for, for the platforms. And that means as artists or um, that there is, you know, you, you can shop around your ideas more. You're not just left with one, um, you know, with one broadcaster or one distributor is that now there's more spaces and you can, if you know, you can even play around in terms of being able to have different offers and different packages for different um, uh, platforms. And that is quite exciting. And I think even in, in that also then being able to create frameworks that are enabling. And I think that comes then from the different governments um, within the continent and being able to create frameworks that enable artists to be able to, um, to grow, but also to work in a space that is protected from a policy point of view. Um, and also being able to work within the continent. And I think, you know, um, a few years ago, they launched the, you know, the free trade um, agreement in the continent, but I, I don't know if we've made that tangible to say, what does it mean for the creative sector? How do we remove the red tape? How do we make it more um, accessible to work from one African country to the, to the next one? How do we combine the East and the North? And, and I think we still, I think from a tangible point of view, there is, we need to deal with those to create an enabling um, environment for the art um, economy to be able to be viable because more than anything we want um, we want uh, in industries that are viable and sustainable 
Um, and I think that is what basically, that is what, um, that is what all artists want. Or at least most artists, if not all, in all economies, we want sustainability and we want viability. Thank you so much, Yolanda, and to the other speakers. Um, so right now, I think we'll just release that survey results. Um, can we have um, some idea of what our um, participants had to say? Am I going to see the results? Okay, there we go. So yeah, we see this a lack, absence of a pan-African market, Yolanda, there's your answer. I mean, the African free trade agreement is here for us. Um, we need to really harness that. Um, we also see there's a lack of investment from the private sector. Um, so thank you for um, all the participants for partaking in the survey. Um, so which brings me now to um, the end part of the session. And I mean, it's it's been so interesting listening to everyone and I wish we had more time um, to engage because there's so many facets. Um, we have a few questions, um, both from um, what our participants had sent. Um, so I'll, I'll start with one question um, from, the, um, from Oyama Ochai, um, Regional Director, Arts and Creative Economy Programs from, from Sub-Saharan Africa for the British Council. Um, and his question is, he's saying, um, Interesting point, Lauren, about attempting to turn artists and creatives into business people. Um, you know, should we be able to, ooh, my eyesight, um, should we also be attempting to attract business disciplines into the creative industry? And can we ever achieve artists and creatives as business people? And can we actually scale it up? Um, yeah, what's your view, Lauren? And then we can also hear from Adi and from Yolanda on this question. I think, again, it depends on the sector. So when we look at the fashion, cosmetics, I mean, if you look at the creative industry from a consumer goods angle, then it's different. Effectively, you tend to see that in those companies, you have like designers, which are the artists, but it's not because they have that strong talent that they cannot be businessmen. And, and once they're not, and if they're not, you can also structure a duo. That's what we tend to see and to do like most of the time in the sense that we operate to make sure that the, the designer has all he needs to really create and we strengthen the capacities. So creating business discipline is, is actually the role, not of the designer and the creative, but of the investor or any kind of platform supporting the designer. So this is where I think we need more and more investment company, the high call, dedicating to those industries, but adopting a specific approach, as I said, depending on the, the industry. So the simple answer is it's not impossible. This is the role of like institutional partner to really create that discipline, build capacity. And that's what we've, we're doing currently with our accelerator program. We have 10 brands at the French Fashion Institute, like following a, color, a curriculum for 10 days and they will be supporting over 10 months and during those 10 months we as Birimian will be behind them supporting them with our college of strategic partners to create institutionalization the key is the institutionalization which not be forced it's a significant uh, process and it's an important one i'll just conclude on this we tend to think that this is particular to creative industry and to artists and that you know they don't have that um like professional commercial institutional stamina i've been investing in the in the african continent for more than a decade being working in private equity before and i can tell you that that lack of institutionalization sometimes has nothing to do as a specificity of the creative industry so proper normal normal african companies sometimes also like like uh governance institutionalization so and and it's not because of this, that we're not attracting equity financing and financial support. So we need to look at creative industry the different way and take it seriously as a business opportunity and to adopt the same kind of mechanism when it comes to investing in those industries. Thanks, Lauren. Adi? Um, I think Lauren's covered it, um, to be honest. But I think, yeah, I. 
I do think creatives can be businesses and entrepreneurs. And we are seeing people who started as a singular creator or singular artist, and then they've, they've gone on to develop, whether it's a production um, company, they've gone on to actually employ people because these create a lot of creators start with their own camera and their own phone, but as they become bigger and they start monetizing and doing more deals, then they, they realize they can't do it all by themselves. And now they also have money to hire an editor. They have money to hire a cameraman, a graphics person. That's them basically building a business because they are employing other people and empowering other people and creating um, um, more uh, economic um, uh, value back to you know to to the to the business and to the industry. So I think definitely creatives can, and we are already seeing creatives um, um, become businesses. Can businesses become creatives? I think it also depends on on the industry and kind of what their the business objective is. I mean, I think YouTube, even though we're a business, we are in the creative economy, and that's. That's our, our goal. That's our mission: is to, you know, give everyone a voice and to empower our the creative economy and all the the markets that we're in. And so, can can businesses become creatives? Also, yes, definitely. And Yolanda, are you seeing this trend? Um, you know, in the kind of work that you do as the National Forma and Video Foundation, because you, when you ultimately fund um, projects, and you also want them to be financially viable. Um, yeah, I think when we fund projects, we want them to be uh, viable. And I think the fortunate thing about film is that it is already a multiplier, it does already have the multiplier effect. Um, you know, one producer being supported is, is one producer being able to create multiple jobs. Um, and I mean, just the film industry in South Africa, just between 19, uh, uh, 2019 and 2020, uh, contributed about 7.2 um, billion towards the GDP. And, and that just means that it wasn't just artists that, that were working in the industry. And I think for film in particular, you, yes, you, there is the creative element, but I think the, the support uh, structure as well as you know, the connected industries, whether it be logistic training, tourism, um, you know, uh, transportation, there is so many uh, multipliers and so many other businesses that are connected to that are connected to the film industry that for us, it is it is just inherent, it comes as part of the deal. So the question then is, if you're going to find a producer who needs to employ these people um, throughout the value chain, they already need to come in with um, and approach film as a business. So yes, creative can be business people. And I think creatives should be business people. And there's many creatives that already are business people. Um, so the, the two coexist naturally, uh, when you, especially when you look at, um, at producers. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we've got our um, expert joining us again, Aubrey, thank you so much. And we still have Rukia. Um, and this question is directed actually, uh, you know, Aubrey, if you could bring in your insights um, from, you know, the work that you do, but also I think from Rukia. Um, and it's a question from, um, Isabella Miana, she's based in Kenya, a management consultant, and her question is, what emerging trends should we be looking out for in the coming year? Yeah, thanks for that question, uh, Crystal. Um, <clears throat> I think the trends are interesting because I do think there are a couple things. One um, is incre increased streaming, of course, that's an ongoing and, and easily predicted trend. Um, I do think we're seeing the return of in-person events um, and that's happening all over. And so that is happening. Um, and I think we're seeing the uh, emergence on the visual arts as well um, as something that is, that is becoming increasingly uh, big uh, in, terms of the, um, <clears throat> in terms of the mix of the creative industries. And last thing I would say is the use of NFTs um, and NFT platforms, social tokens, things of that sort uh, will continue to be uh, of interest. There is uh, you know, a Nigerian digital artist named Osanachi who has been using 
uh, NFTs, and I think others will follow. So those are some of the trends I see on the horizon. Thank you, Aubrey. And from your side, Rukia, working with artists, working on the ground and having a, you know, another kind of Pan-African view on it? Um, yeah, I, I, I think there are um, um, uh, um, an increase of interest and of uh, artists themselves discovering uh, through streaming what happens somewhere else in Africa. That's very important. The connection, the streaming, the connection possibility that uh, streaming, uh, streaming uh, offered uh, uh, to the uh, to people uh, in different countries of the continent, and uh, that makes um, uh, uh, that young artists have uh, new ideas and realize what they could do. Uh, uh, taking example on what they have seen. Uh, uh, somewhere else, uh, and uh, a Nollywood example is uh, comes again and again, always, and I think it's a success, as uh, uh, it's been said already, because uh, people inside Nigeria themselves uh, uh, the, had an interest in it. So they're, they're in here. Basically, we we have um, uh, um, uh, the many interest in uh, different skills, artistic skills, but uh, also the situation of the country here is not easy for now since the two, three years uh, for uh, uh, culture and art, art um, uh, area to um, be uh, the, what it used to be in the past. Uh, we have a, a problem of uh, audience and also for, of opportunity for the artists. So that makes uh, everything uh, uh, very difficult to analyze and uh, have a clear idea about what it, what's happening and what can be the very uh, next future. Thank you so much. So I think we obviously reaching the end of our webinar, but I would like to go back a round table to everyone, giving you one minute. Um, do you know in summary what would be the main message you want us to take home as we conclude this very interesting um, seminar and we'll start with you Lauren. Thank you Crystal. Well the main message again is like we have that power to change our image and narrative through our creative industries so let's try to find the right model of development we have to to invest our own creative economy so we need to find the right set of partners, the right set of investors, the right set of actors, and also connect to an ecosystem. So let's roll our sleeves, let's roll our sleeves and get to work. Fantastic. Yolanda? Um, I think we need, um, we need uh, private investment in the, you know, in the, to, uh, to come into the economy and to be able to to um, to trust and and work with us. So mine would then be say, let's make those connections with the private sector. There is all kinds of money that is available out there, um, even if it's not the most uh, it, it it is not the most money. But I think we can get into those spaces where we are able to go for the private uh, money because I, it does come you know um, easier. You know it has less red tape than but also being able to um to 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 allow and to speak and to request and lobby governments to be able to create a framework and policies that are enabling to to the industry and it would be you know that um even governments take the the creative industry and as as you know as a contributor to the economy um as a space that could potentially change how Africa does business and there's great potential in that. And I personally believe that. Great. Is Adi still with us? Adi, last one minute um, closing remarks from you. Yeah, sorry. My um, signal dropped off. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think it's exciting times for just the creative industry in Africa. I think the amount of creativity that we're seeing coming out, whether it's in our movies, whether it's, it's in um, just everyday content from creators or even music. We talked about Jerusalem um, or, or WizKids Essence. I think it's super exciting times and it's a mixture of having 
support from the government for the industry and putting the right regulations in place, but having businesses like ours, at, you know, at Google, at YouTube, um, also, you know, finding initiatives or ways where we can support and empower the creators and the artists on the continent, right? So, and in the last year, we've implemented things like our Black Voices Fund um, or our Emerging Talent Initiative that supports emerging talent, um, music artists and community organizations in South Africa. So we've done a lot of things that are really about supporting the, the creative industry and also helping to to um, amplify the voices of our creators. Because again, it's about not only finding an audience in your country, it's finding an, an international audience to, to widen um, the reach and the, the exportability and the monetization that you can get. So a lot of our focus is not is supporting creators and artists in the market, but also helping them amplify, amplify their voices. And I think, yeah, it's super exciting times, definitely. Great. We'll go to Rokia and then we'll leave the closing last remarks from you, Aubrey. So Rokia first. Um, I think we definitely need private investors because we need uh, uh, the money to do even better what started already. Uh, definitely there is something there to, to, to work on, to develop and uh, to make uh, more stable and productive for the continent. Uh, for that, we need money. And uh, uh, governments, for the, all the several reasons that we've been talking about already, uh, uh, are not as efficient as we would like the, 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 them to be. So um, private uh, investors are the, a real solution to, to support. Uh, uh, creative uh, industries in Africa. Thank you, Rukia. And then our expert, Aubrey, you've heard from everyone, money, money, money. I think it's coming. Um, I think there's, you know, if you look at the trends for African venture writ large, uh, it's hot right now. Um, these, the sector's sexy. Look at what's happening in the sports industry with the NBA. Um, and, and having a consortium of investors that include former President Obama. Um, so I think there's interest. How we translate that interest into tangible things is important and it's gonna take interlocutors like Lorene and others who have the experience of investment and structuring to really point these uh, potential investors into the right funds. So again, I said there's Heva Fund, there's what Roberta is trying to build, um, but I think there'll be a few more of those. And those funds are gonna to need to look for bankable and investable deals. And so there'll need to be some thought around that as well. So it really is another classic case where there's the intermediation will be incredibly important uh, to, to transform the interest into actual investment dollars. Um, but I'm optimistic for the sector for sure. Thank you so much, Aubrey, for ending this webinar on a very optimistic note. Um, thank you to all our speakers for your insights. I mean, I learned such a lot and I, I wish we could go on, but um, I think, you know, we, we're reaching the end of it. Um, but again, we just want to say, you know, um, thank you for your time and your insights. Of course, the, this is part of a series from the Women Working for Change, which is part of the Africa CEO Forum. Um, our next webinar will happen in December on the 2nd, and that will be Women in STEM. So we'll talk about women and science. And of course, then we hope to see all of you um, in March 2022 in um, Abidjan, in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and thank you so much for partaking in this creative industries um, and dealing with the issue of how can Africa capitalize on its artistic boom. Thank you very much. <laughs>